وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن اذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عذنا من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا واصلح لنا شاننا كله لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وبعد فقال المؤلف الامام النووي رحمه الله ونفعنا به وبكم الحديث السادس عن ابي عبد الله النعمان بن بشير رضي الله عنهما قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ان الحلال بين وان الحرام بين وبينهما امور مشتبهات لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس فمن اتقى الشبهات فقد استبرا لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام كراعي يرعى حول الهمى يوشك ان يرتع فيه الا وان لكل ملك حما الا وان حما الله محارم الا وان في الجسد مدغه اذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله واذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله الا وهي القلب رواه البخاري ومسلم حديث نمبر 6 ان امام نووي از كولكشن from Abdullah Al-Numan ibn Bashir he said I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say inna al-halal bayin what is halal is clear wa inna al-haram bayin and what is haram is clear wa bainahuma amurun mushtabihatun la ya'lamuhuna kathirun min al-nas between these two there's many issues which are unclear Most people don't know, don't have knowledge of this. Most people, not 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 most, kathiru, many people, many people, do not have knowledge of these unclear issues. This is one of the beauty of our deen. That there are certain things which are halal and there are certain things which are haram, which is well known to everyone. And you won't find any dispute amongst people, amongst the, the, the people of Islam, Fali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Sometimes these were referred, these things were referred to by the ulama as those things which are ma'loom min ad-deen bin darura. Ma'loom min ad-deen bin darura. These are things that are clearly known to everyone, every Muslim. Such as a Muslim has to pray five times a day, it's fard. A Muslim is forbidden to drink alcohol. A Muslim is, has to fast in Ramadan. A Muslim sister has to cover all of her body except for her face and hands and feet. And according to some ulama, even the face has to be covered, but according to uh, the majority, which is the Hanafi Mafab, the, the, the face and the hands do not need to be covered. All of these things are, are known to all Muslims. There cannot, cannot be any ikhtilaf in these things. There cannot be any difference of opinion. Because these are the type of things that all Muslims knew at the time of the Prophet at the time of Sahaba, at the time of their students. So every generation, you know, because it's not even something you need, you don't need a hadith for this. Because this is passed from every Muslim to every Muslim to every Muslim in every generation. Every Muslim of the Sahaba generation passed these to every Muslim of the next generation. That you, we have to pray five times a day, we have to fast Ramadan, a woman has to cover herself, etc, etc. These are things you can't, there's no, there's no need to say, oh, we have got a hadith to prove this. Yeah, because it's beyond that, it's what we call mutawatir. It's mutawatir. There's such a huge number of people 
that are giving you this information that there's no dispute about it. For example, if how many people here have been to China? You put your hand up if you've been to China. One person here. Yeah? Now, for the rest of you, do you have any doubt that there is a country called China? Any doubt whatsoever in your mind? Even a tiny fraction of a doubt that there is a country called China. So even though you've never been there, you've never seen it for yourself. Why do you believe in it with certainty, with yaqeen? Is because the news about it is mutawatir. It's come from so many different sources that you can't even count. That people have told you there is a place called China. That it leaves you with actually no doubt whatsoever. That's, that's the concept within our deen within what we call asul, which is known as mutawatir. If something comes from so many different sources, and there's no way that they could have got together to deceive you, yeah, there's no way they could have got together to deceive you from so many different sources, then it becomes mutawatir, it becomes a definite, uh, definite knowledge that you have. So this is similar to these things like alcohol is prohibited. Muslims don't eat uh, pork, etc. So these things are, are clear in the deen. <coughs> and that's the beauty of the deen. You know, we, we know which things are clear. There's no need to, uh, there's no need to dispute about it. And then those, there's some things which are unclear, which we had. <coughs> these things, you know, we shouldn't fall into dispute about them. Uh, as one of uh, uh, one uh, hadith, al-ikhtilafu, uh, al-ikhtilafu fi ummati rahma. That the ikhtilaf in this ummah is a rahma, is a mercy. Uh, the, so, the, so difference of opinion is is natural. It's bound to come about in some certain matters. It's, it's, it's inevitable. Um, and this is the basis of why we have four different schools of law. Because there are certain, 80 or 90 percent of things they all agree upon. But that 10 or 20 percent of issues which they have a disagreement. For example, the um, school of Abu Hanifa they do. They raise the hand just in the opening to be Allahu Akbar. Then they they don't all raise the hand again. Same with the Maliki school. But with the Shafi school, they will raise the hands before they go for ruku, etc. So these are issues where there's a possibility for difference of opinion, and and that's acceptable to us. And we respect each other uh, in these differences of opinion. Now, if someone came to you and said to you. Uh, a Muslim is allowed to drink alcohol, or a Muslim is allowed to eat pork, then no, we don't respect, that is not difference of opinion. Because those are the issues which are clear, that's, you know, that's absolutely no doubt about, that no one's disagreed about for over a thousand years. They're known in this deed without any type of uh, doubt, you know. So this is this is what this hadith is clearly saying as well. You know, the in al halal bayin, or in al haram bayin, those things are clear. Why bainahum abur mushtabihat? This difference of opinion, you know, some some people of recent recent times have claimed that you know we we no longer need difference of opinion and we now live in a time where we've got a lot more knowledge about hadith and things like that so we can get rid of the difference of opinion and we should all follow the, the one correct way. This is a claim, this is a, a stance that has been put forward uh, by some uh, scholars who, who don't believe that you should follow any particular school of law or madhab. So they say, look, you know, we, we've got much more access to more hadith now. So there's no need to have these differences of opinion. We should, we know what the, the, the real uh, part is.
uh, for example, you know, um, there's a book written by a prominent uh, uh, a writer called Abu Amina Bilal Phillips called Blind Following of the Mathabs, quite some time back now, but quite a sort of bestseller, I think, in which he clearly states that, you know, we can now resolve the differences and we should just have one way that everyone has to follow. Now, let me give you an example just to illustrate the point. Where the Quran says, وَالْمُتَلَّقَاتُ يَتَرَبَّسْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءٍ المتلقات, women who have been divorced. يَتَرَبَّسْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءٍ they need to stay by themselves for three quru. It is idda. They have to stay in the idda for three quru. What's the meaning of quru? Any, anyone have an idea? Three monthly menstruation. Is that the, the, the meaning of it? Three months. Well, the thing is, um, we don't know. It can have two different meanings. One meaning is it can be the, the, the period of bleeding, the menstruation of the woman, the period of bleeding. The other meaning is it can be the period of purity between two menstrual periods, the time of purity, when the woman is not on the height, you know. Both of those meanings exist in that word, the singular of Quru, Qur, Qur in Arabic. Now, we don't have any definitive hadith of the Prophet telling us what is the meaning in this particular uh, ayah of Quran. So, Sayyiduna Ali عنه, and Sayyiduna Umar, عنه, two of the greatest, of the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba, they had a difference of opinion here. Sayyiduna Umar who he said, فَلَاتَةَ قُرُوءُ means the woman has to wait for three uh, periods of purity, three periods of purity to pass. Sayyiduna Ali's opinion was that the Qur is the period of the bleeding itself, and he said the woman has to wait for three monthly periods of bleeding to pass. Now from there, uh, this same difference of opinion, is then found in the Shafi Mazhab, which took the opinion of Abu, Abu uh, Umar, and the Hanafi Mazhab, which took the opinion of Ali. Right? So, with the Shafi's, until today, the woman who is divorced, she will have to wait until three periods of purity are finished. Whereas with the Hanafi's, if a woman gets divorced, she has to wait for three menstrual periods. At the end of the third menstrual period, her <coughs> idda is finished. So the time period is different. It's slightly different, you know, it's approximately three months in both cases, but it, it can be different by quite a few couple of weeks. So you tell me, how do we now resolve that difference of opinion? How can we resolve that difference of opinion today? How do they propose? Well, I don't think they have an answer. I don't know, <laughs> you'll have to ask you. But I don't think they have an answer to that because if, you know, unless they, they, they know better than Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Omar, you know, and they're going to say one of them got it wrong. And there's many, many examples like that. I think, you know, you don't, some of you sat in the fiqh with the CD Faisal about the wiping of the head. The Quran just says wipe the head in wudu. But it doesn't say how much is the minimum amount to make your wudu valid. You know, so if I wiped half my head, is my wudu okay, or do I need to wipe the whole head? Yeah. The Quran just says, from sahu bi ru'usikum. From sahu ru'usikum, just wipe your head. It doesn't say how much of the head is obligatory to fulfill the wudu. So from there, uh, three of the Imams differed. Imam uh, Shafri said, at least one hair is the minimum. Even if you just wipe one hair, you fulfill the command in the Quran. The Malikis took the complete opposite. Ma Imam Malik's position was, you have to wipe the whole head. And even if you miss any part of the head, you have not fulfilled the command in the Quran. 
Abu Hanifa's opinion was in between, uh, and the Hanafi Mazhab says that you have to wipe at least one quarter of the head. And they based that on one particular um, hadith that they have a narration in which um, the Prophet is reported to have been seen doing wudu and then wiping the nasiya, the front fore, fore, forelock they call it, the front part of the head head. Uh, even though it's not a very strong narration, but that's the only narration we have set showing the minimum, the least that we've, we know that the Prophet wiped. So, based on that, they said at least one quarter of the head must be wiped to fulfill the command of the Quran. So you can see that the way the difference of opinion comes in. You know, everyone agrees, yes, you must wipe your head. In the wudu, so these type of ikhtilaf, there's no harm in that. We don't, we don't need to, you know, we, we, have, we have respect uh, between us for these type of ikhtilafat. The Imam al-Shafi, rahimullah, like I mentioned in the previous dars, he was a student of Imam Malik. And he was a student of the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. So he, he, was, he had full respect for both of these teachers. And, but then he got to a level of knowledge where he was making his own ishtihad. So he, you know, he forms his own opinions, often different to those of his teachers. And but what did, for example, he when you know it's narrated that when Imam Shafi once was in Baghdad near the grave of Abu Hanifa, he visited the grave of Abu Hanifa. And when he was praying, uh, when it was time for the prayer near near the where Abu Hanifa was buried, Rahimullah, when he prayed, he said he didn't say the Amin loudly. He said it quietly, even though his opinion was that Amin should be said loudly. He said it quietly, just from respect of Abu Hanifa. And one of the statements of Imam Sharafi is, all of us are the children of Abu Hanifa in fiqh. Just shows the sort of type of respect that these Imams had for one another. Once Abu Hanifa visited Imam Malik, because they were contemporaries, Imam Abu Hanifa was in Kufa and Imam Malik was in Medina. Once Imam Abu Hanifa visited Imam Malik when he was doing the Hajj and the Umrah, they were, he went to Medina. He visited Imam Malik and they were together in the room by themselves for some time. And uh, students of Imam Malik were waiting outside. And when Imam Abu Hanifa left, they came in and they saw Imam Malik was sitting and sweating. <laughs> and uh, Imam Malik said to them, you know, this, this man, if he wanted to prove to you that this pillar is made of gold, he could have proved it. You know, so these are the type of respect they had. In fact, within the Hanafi Madhab, is a principle in Asul uh, that you know, if we don't find the hukam within our own Madhab, we go to the Maliki Madhab. So anyway, this is just the type of thing. We don't need to um, be fighting over issues um, we shouldn't condemn people, you know, uh, you know, why, why has the Imam not got a long beard? Why is he not wearing a hat today? Before condemning people, just think, you know, there, maybe there's something behind that. The person's studied, you know, maybe there's a difference of opinion between ulama uh, about these issues. So, you know, it's part of lack of knowledge to actually become uh, um, obsessed and critical about certain issues that you, you really don't have much knowledge about. You know? But you want to... Uh, so that's through lack of knowledge. We need to study more of the deen, inshallah. So then the Prophet said, the one who stays away from doubtful things, then he has protected his deen and his honor. So the shubuhat, the doubtful things, um, are those things we're not sure, you know, are they halal or haram? We're not sure. Some people may say they're halal, some people may say they're haram. For example, I don't know, smoking cigarettes or things like that. Yeah. Eating certain types of things, you know, certain types of food, you know, some people say they're halal, some say they're haram. Uh, these type of issues, you know, the shubuhat. The Prophet said, if you stay away from these, 
uh, then you have protected your deen more. You know? And your ill, your honor. <coughs> the, the concept of ill, honor, is very important uh, within Islam. One of the things that um, is being lost amongst uh, contemporary culture in the West, you know, these type of these type of concepts like honor, uh, being truthful, these things were very, very important in this deen and very, very important to people in the past. But the society we live in is uh, completely negating these type of uh, concepts, which in ways that we don't realize sometimes. You know, if you, if you just think about people around you, non-Muslims, etc. Does the word honor mean anything to them anymore? Does being truthful mean anything anymore? To people, you know? Um, this is a part of, uh, part of the satanic nature of the times that we live in. The shaitan is always trying to take human beings down. You know, from their maqam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the human being honor. You know, creating him as an honorable, <coughs> a noble creature. And the, the honor of the human being comes through being upright, comes through being truthful, <coughs> comes through guarding one's honor. So, so shaitan, he always wants to try to take that away from the human being. Because of his hasad, you know, his hasad. <coughs> so we now actually have a sort of satanic culture, a whole culture where things like our young younger people are exposed to programs like The Apprentice and other type of uh, programs and films, which are actually teaching the opposite values to what all religions teach. Not just Islam now, you know, we can say this is something even wider than Islam. This is a, something that all religions had in common, these type of virtues, you know, of being humble. Think about every, any major, major world religion, you know, what do they say about being humble, being kind to your neighbor, being uh, merciful, being truthful, being upright. But what this culture is teaching us through these type of, um, you know, these things is teaching you be proud, be arrogant, step, step, on the, step on the head of your neighbor, you know, be ruthless in business. Be ruthless in business, doesn't matter if you have to so-called bend the truth, which just means to lie, you know. Be ruthless in business. That's, that's, that's encouraged, that is praised, that is given to our children in, in business studies courses and just in the whole surrounding culture as a, as a virtue now. This is a great thing. You know, be like a shark. Be like a... Be ruthless. You know, these billionaires you see coming out there saying, you know, they had to stamp on the feet of uh, so many ex-people to get to that place where they are now. Uh, just taking that example of this program, The Apprentice, look how they, they're supposed to work together and then when they come into the boardroom, they have to start stabbing each other in the back. Is this something good? This is being glamorized and presented to our children that this is uh, what a human being is supposed to be. <laughs> you know, one of our sheikhs told us in, in Damascus, where in, in the last generation, you know, Muslim, you know, the way they, in the souk, when they used to have shops, if one shopkeeper had business that day, and another customer came, he would say to the customer, go next door to my neighbor. Because you know? he's had his business, he's had some result, he said, go to my neighbor, because he wanted him to have some income as well. That's actually what we're supposed to be like. That's what, we, that's what human beings are supposed to be like. So you see how, you know, you can't emphasize enough that this is a satanic culture. This is really all of the opposite virtues, you know, like being humble, 
being merciful, being kind, helping one's neighbor. These are all being contradicted. And the opposites are being presented to us as, as things which are good. So the concept of error and honor has no, no hardly meaning anymore. And, and don't underestimate, you know, for our children that are growing up in this culture, if they're being exposed to these type of programs, these type of films, where evil is glamorized. Evil is glamorized. You know, this is a recent phenomenon, you know, this is quite recent, within the last 10 or 20 years in our lifetime we've seen this change. When they first started having, uh, when film first started coming, they still used to have like a, you have the good guys and the bad guys, you know. The good guys, he's a good person, he's a truthful, he helps the poor, you know, and the bad guys are very uh, ugly looking villainous type of people. Now, I don't know if people have uh, been keeping track of latest type of programs and films that come from Hollywood, that the bad, the villains are glamorized. This all started with, you know, gangster type of films. First, gangsters start becoming glamorized. Uh, now they have all sorts of different type of, you know, vampires and all these things, uh, where they put the most attractive looking people in those roles. The most attractive looking people so is glamorizing that to our younger generation. Imagine what impact is having on children, on younger people who are seeing this. That, that, that's the glamorous uh, position to be in. You know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a real corruption taking place of our youth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and give us our understanding of the deen. So really, I mean, you know, we have to teach Islam according to the time and place and context we're in. You know, there's, there's no point talking about... Uh, um, uh, there's no point talking about uh, what we call a wara and staying away from doubtful things. When the, the, the situation is much more dire than that. We need to stay away from haram first, right now. You know, real, real, real bad and uh, corrupting influences that are taking place. Uh, so anyway, the Prophet said, "Woman waqa'a fi shubuhat, waqa'a fi haram Whoever falls into doubtful things, he falls into the haram. And he explained further by saying, it's like a shepherd who is taking his sheep around um, a protected place. You know, so you're a, you, you're a shepherd, you have sheep and you're taking them to graze, but there's a place you're not allowed to go, which belongs to the king, let's say. Like Hima, the, the, uh, you're not allowed to take your sheep into that field. So you need to be careful, if you take the sheep too close, they may stray inside the forbidden zone. So the same sort of idea here. If we stay away from doubtful matters, we'll be further away from the haram. And the, the Quran says, La taqrabu a zina. Don't come close to zina. It doesn't say, don't commit zina. Don't come close. In other words, so we start by lowering our gaze. We start by lowering our gaze because we don't even want to go near that uh, place. Um, so then the Prophet said, each, every king has a forbidden sanctuary. And the forbidden sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is those things which he has made forbidden. So this is the place, you know, the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. We should just stay away from that area. You know? And by avoiding the doubtful matters, we keep ourselves more away uh, from those things which are haram. These are clearly the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's, no, uh, there's no spiritual progress or purification or iman. The first step is to stay away from the haram. The first step is to stay away from the haram. And in another later hadith in, in, the, in, in this book, 
the Prophet ﷺ mentions, which is related to this hadith we are doing today. Uh, uh, let me find the hadith, inshallah, so I don't quote it over here. Those things which I have forbidden you, stay away from them. And those things which I have commanded you, do as much as you can. So see the difference, the things that have been forbidden, stay away from them. No, no question. Those things which I have commanded to you, do as much as you can. So there's a clear difference. The things which are haram, which, we, which is agreed upon, which is haram, yeah, which everyone agrees upon are haram, we should not step into that zone. We should not step into that at all in any way. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the capacity to stay completely away from those things which are haram. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to, to, to be able to stay away from the haram. The things which the deen commands us to do are different. It's very difficult actually for any of us to completely fulfill and the things which we are commanded to do, which include the, the fard, not just fard ayn, but fard kifaya as well. The things which are obligatory upon us as individuals and as a community. You know, very difficult for us to fulfill all of those. But the things which are forbidden, we really, really, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq, uh, myself first from anyone, to, to really to, to stay away from those things and before we do that we have to know what are those things which are haram you know so that takes ilm we have to have knowledge how do I know which things Allah has forbidden you know? we need to get some knowledge we need to study that so for example get uh, you know Riyadu Salihin Riyadu Salihin of Imam Nawu with the same author which you'll find in every masjid every bookshop you can get it online free PDF yeah, chapter towards the end on prohibited actions. The chapter on those things which are prohibited. Is that in English? Yes, in English as well. This one's Arabic, but it's widely PDF, available in PDF in, uh, in, uh, in English. It's called Riyadu Salihin. Go to the chapter on prohibited actions and you will find the, the main things uh, that have been prohibited, which are haram. You know, so we need to become aware of those things, uh, first of all. And there's many books as well, as Imam al-Zahabi's, Imam al-Zahabi's al-Kaba'ir, which is also available in English. Al-Kaba'ir meaning major sins. Yeah. Uh, there's a book called Reliance of the Traveler. People know it's quite a big book, but it has a section on, in English on prohibited action. So we need to find out, you know, uh, what's, what's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited to us. So we can stay away from them. And then the Prophet ﷺ finished off the hadith on a slightly different thing, saying that in the jasadi mudra, in the body is a, a a a piece of flesh. Remember the same term was used in the other hadith about the alaqa and the mudra. So sticky, then it becomes like a chewed, like a piece of flesh. So mudra, a piece of meat or flesh. Uh, if it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. Allah wa hiya al is it? This is the heart. The heart. So, the heart, there's two aspects of the heart. The physical heart and the body, which pumps blood around the body. And the spiritual heart, which is also known as qalb and also known as Ruh. This is uh, as the, the, you know, the, the, is often used interchangeably, Qalb and Ruh. Is of same meaning, although uh, 
there can be some differences in the meaning depending on how it's used and where it's used. But often it's used as the same meaning as well. Our ruh wal qalb, Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, goes into great detail in defining these terms in Ihya al din in the chapter called Aja'ib al qulub the wonders of the hearts. He talks about qalb, ruh, nafs, aql. These are all actually different aspects of the same thing, which is the soul, the human soul. <coughs> the different aspects of the same entity, which is the human soul or the ruh. The ruh is, uh, first of all, don't forget we said yesterday what the Quran says about the ruh. You have only been given a little knowledge about it. You've only been given very little knowledge about the ruh. So whatever we say is just part of this very little knowledge that we've been given as a human beings about the ruh. It, according to the scholars, it, uh, it is in every part of our body. The ruh is in every part of our body. Uh, just like the blood goes to every part of our body, the ruh is dispersed through every part of our body. Um, but it may be more focused and concentrated in the area of the heart, the spiritual heart. Uh, and when someone dies, obviously the ruh leaves the body. And sometimes in the past they used to see people dying slowly. Nowadays often people die quickly, you know, witness them dying. Because the, the diseases and illnesses of today are different to the past. The Prophet said one of the signs of the last day is there will be sudden death. And now one of the major causes of death, especially in the Western world, the leading cause of death is a severe sudden heart attack. So people just suddenly, they fall down dead with a massive heart attack. That's one of the signs of Akhir al-Zaman. But in the past, people used to die a bit slowly, you know, maybe over several days. They would, what we call Sakaratul Maut, they go through the agonies of death, you know, they, they die slowly. And people used to literally see the soul leaving the body, you know, slowly, the, first the feet become cold, and then it, you know, the, it slowly moves up, and the soul comes from out of here. So the, the body starts becoming cold, cold, and then the, the, eventually the, the soul leaves the body. So that, that's the, anyway, that's the ruh and the qalb. I won't talk too much about it because obviously that's a whole um, discussion in itself about the qalb. Uh, if it is sound, the whole body is sound. If our spiritual heart is sound, um, our whole iman and our uh, ma'rifah will be sound. You know, so. If the spiritual heart is corrupt, then everything will be corrupt. So those diseases of the heart, which I mentioned in great detail, all based on uh, from the Quran and the Hadith, like uh, pride, hatred, bukhut, hasad, envy, um, riya, showing off in one good action, um, all of these diseases of the heart, which are there that corrupt uh, the heart, then you know all of our being will become corrupted. All of our mu'amalat, all of our interactions with others will become corrupted. The more that our hearts are purified from these type of diseases, uh, arrogance, pride, envy, hatred, all these things, the more our actions will reflect the state of our heart because the state of the hearts will always be manifest on the limbs. You know, if a person is proud in his heart, it will manifest on the way he walks, the way he talks, the way he interacts with you. Whereas, if a person is humble, uh, that will also then manifest in the limbs. Now, obviously, there is a certain type of tasannah. There, there can be a certain type of uh, acting. So, someone may be proud, but they're acting humble. This is, this is also possible, but sooner or later his true state will manifest. 
sooner or later the true state will manifest and that you know the people of uh, um, the people of Tarbiya, the people who are experienced and trained in Tarbiya, they can see you know what's what's the state of people's hearts but just by the way they behave and the way they interact. So someone, uh, for example, Sayyidina Umar who he saw a man walking along, uh, looking down towards the ground. You know, just looking very humbly down and walking along. Uh, Sayyidina Umar hit him on the back, smacked him on the back, and said, "No, no, this is not the, this is not the, what it's about. This is not what it means to be humble." And so, be humble is a state of the heart. You know, in you know, the, the person could be full of pride because he thinks he's acting humble. You know what I mean? So this was obviously some of the more subtle and um, detailed uh, discussions the, the scholars had about pride and everything. Um, to to bring about humbleness in the heart, one has to train oneself as well. So someone may feel this pride and they have to force themselves to be humble. When they force themselves and force themselves, then the hum hum humbleness will come slowly, slowly. So it comes through this mujahada, this type of effort one has to take. And that effort is, I'm just going to finish off inshallah on this point, that effort is simply to do those things that the nafs doesn't want to do. Those things which your pride doesn't want you to do, that's what you have to force yourself to do, to make yourself humble. So for example, serving other Muslims, serving Muslim brothers and sisters, cleaning up, uh, let's say the masjid for example. You know, there are certain actions which are humbling by their nature, and this was one of the main ways how the, the scholars of Tarbiya often used to train people to become humble. You know, put them on toilet duty. You know, not for one day, but for a few months, maybe a couple of few years. Yeah, you you in charge of cleaning the toilets every day. Very soon, the person will be a humble person. You know, one of our sheikhs, he said about his grand sheikh, when he when he took uh, when he took the spiritual path with his sheikh, uh, his sheikh told him go around the main souk, souk Hamidiyah in Damascus, and, and ask people for money. Now this person was a respectable individual known for his family, from Ahlul Bayt. See, within the community he had this Izza. He said, go and ask people for money, but put a hole in your pocket. So whenever he was given money, it would just drop. You know, so he wasn't doing it for the money, he was doing it to train him in how to be humble because you know you can imagine the old community saying look at this so and so from this family what's he doing going around begging people for money so these were just ways to train people uh, to be humble uh, now in the absence of of having uh, people shiuch to guide us in tarbiya we have to uh, do take some steps ourselves because it's obligatory to get rid of pride from our hearts why? Because the Prophet said in the Sahih, which is not disputed, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من الكبر من الكبر He will not enter Jannah who has got one, one atom of pride in his heart. So these are the, the reasons why it's uh, obligatory to actually become, you know, to, to, to get rid of these diseases of the heart. You know, so we have to uh, give ourselves, you know, train ourselves to be humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To do that, we have to be humble in front of other, our brothers and sisters around us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to purify our hearts, to rid our hearts of all the diseases that are displeasing to Him, to fill our hearts with love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and struggling and striving in His path and love of the Akhirah. جزا الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما هو أهل جزا الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما هو أهل جزا الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما هو أهل سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين.
Any burning questions? <laughs>